Good afternoon. We think about heartworms in dogs and cats, but I'm here to talk about all the other species. And so we are going to begin our journey in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1887, when a young boy obtained the dubious distinction of becoming the very first documented case of heartworm in a human being. Apparently, the records have been lost to a house fire, so some of the nuances are lost to history. Some people say that there was a single male, and some people say there was a single female heartworm in the left side of the heart of this boy. Others say the right, but nobody disputes the fact that this was the very first documented case of heartworm in a human being. Fast forward 50 years to New Orleans, Louisiana, when Dr. Ernest Faust and his colleagues discovered a single male 12 centimeter long heartworm in the vena cava of a 73 year old female cadaver. As it turns out, heartworms are opportunists. In the 1980s and 1990s, the CDC reported over 80 cases of heartworm disease in, hu in human beings worldwide. Today, there are over 300 cases worldwide. It appears that CDC also said that instance rate is growing, and that appears to be true. Heartworms are opportunists. And while heartworms in humans, humans don't tend to be symptomatic for heartworms, thank goodness, they have been found, and humans have been found also susceptible to aberrant migration similar to other animals. Heartworms in humans have been found in the brain, in the subcutaneous tissue, in the vitreous humor, in the pulmonary vasculature, in the heart, in the testicles, and in the urine. Perhaps the most disturbing of these lesions is the finding on thoracic radiographs in humans of these characteristic coin lesions. These coin lesions, as you see here, unfortunately mimic other more serious potential lesions in human beings, including hydatid cysts, tuberculosis, and cancer. This results in oftentimes invasive, sometimes painful, and amazingly expensive diagnostic tests to get a definitive biopsy. One estimate, esti one estimate is about $88,000 to find out what this is in a human being. Now we go to the 1950s, when scientists made a remarkable discovery of heartworms in focid or earless seals, the harbor seal a very close relative of Dirofilaria imidis, Acanthochilinema spirochidata, was found in seals, in pinniped species. Since this time, we found, scientists have found more heartworms in all the pinniped species in the northern hemisphere. This means especially that the California sea lion seems to be quite susceptible to heartworms, with up to three dozen heartworms found in the pulmonary vasculature of these animals. Zoo veterinarians know this, and they place their animals on once-monthly off-label um, heartworm prevention. Other, other animals in the northern hemisphere and throughout the northern hemisphere and in the Arctic Circle the harp, the hooded, and the ring seals all have been found to have heartworm disease. For many years, scientists debated the phylogeny of pinniped species, wanting to place them on the phylogenic tree near wolves and dogs, but they couldn't find a common ancestor until 2007. This intriguing animal was featured in the magazine Nature. It had four legs, it was semi-aquatic, it had webbed feet, a foreshortened snout, and carnivorous teeth. Finally, scientists found their missing link for pinniped species. And they placed them then, squarely where they had wanted to place them, on the phylogenic tree in the superorder carnivora, snuggled right next to the panda and the other canine species. This brings us to a very intriguing possibility. Could it be that heartworms find their preferred hosts by traipsing down the phylogenic superhighway, if you will, in the family superorder carnivora? We know that in wildlife, 
in wild canines, the dogs, the, can the dingoes, the wolves, the coyotes, foxes, we know that these animals provide us with a very healthy wildlife reservoir for our canine and feline species domestic living nearby. It shouldn't come, if we adopt this idea and premise, it shouldn't come as much of a surprise then that family as we come on down to the mustelids who are members of the carnivore family are also highly susceptible to heartworm. In fact, the reintroduction of the endangered black-footed ferret into the western United States was at one time thought to be um, in jeopardy by the finding of an unidentified antigen cross-reacting ELISA positive heartworm. And this brings us to one of my favorite pet species, the domestic ferret. The domestic ferret, by most accounts, has been, for the last several decades, in the top 10 most popular pets in the United States. We do know that they are highly susceptible to heartworm, just as dogs are. And yet, what we know about the prevention and the treatment for heartworm in ferrets pales in comparison to dogs and cats. This is what we do know about heartworms in ferrets. A they are highly susceptible to heartworm infection. With populations of adult heartworms similar to that of dogs, relative to the heart size, B, they rarely mount a microfilaremia, similar to cats. C, you cannot treat these guys with melarsamine or you'll kill them, like cats. One interesting finding uh, is consistent finding of heartworm positive ferrets is bilirubinuria. We know this happens consistently in heartworm-positive ferrets, but we have absolutely no idea what the prognostic or predictive value is in ferrets. It used to be that those of us who do a lot of exotic species used to take once monthly off-label ivermectin and mix it with a nice sweet ferritone, which is an amino acid um, supplement that they like. Now we're lucky we have a once monthly topical license prevention for use in ferrets. Our mission at the Heartworm Society is prevention, management, treatment, and education about heartworms. We live in an era of unprecedented disease emergence, spurred on by environmental de degradation, habitat destruction and fragmentation, global warming, or climate change, whatever you want to call it, human and animal movement across the planet. We know that canine species live in all habitats and all continents on, the, on this earth. During this era of disease emergence, we look to sentinel species that might give us some idea of early warning. If our mission is to follow this vector-borne disease and find a cure, or at least help prevent and treat it, we need to be looking into the wildlife species, in my opinion. If we're going to follow the premise that heartworms find their preferred antigenic host by following the phylogenic superhighway of the superorder carnivora, I wonder what would happen if we put some of our attention on the panda the raccoon, the skunk, for instance, might we find a yet unidentified but important reservoir for heartworms? Thank you. <laughs>